One of the surprises for astronomers this century has been the discovery of molecules, some of them quite complex, in the apparently empty space between the stars. Using telescopes like this, more than 60 molecules have been identified. Identification of these molecules is done by comparing their spectra with spectra obtained in the laboratory. To measure an absorption spectrum in the optical region, for instance, we would use a spectrometer consisting of a source of radiation which is passed through a gas. The radiation is then split into its different wavelengths and the amount absorbed at each wavelength measured. The first observations of interstellar molecules were very similar. A telescope was pointed at a star, the source of radiation. The light then passes through the interstellar medium, the gas, and into the telescope. The light collected by the telescope is led into a spectrograph. The resulting spectrum is recorded on a photographic plate. One of the first interstellar molecules to be identified this way was CH. The story of its identification is told by the eminent spectroscopist and Nobel Prize winner, Gerhard Hertzberg. I don't know whether anybody really expected uh, molecules until 1937, when uh, at that time the people at Mount Wilson Observatory found a number of lines that they couldn't identify with atomic lines. And of course atomic lines in the visible region where the spectrum was were very well known even at that time so one didn't have any uh, much of a choice and uh, then uh, 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 Swings and Rosenfeld came along with a paper in which they suggested that uh, one of the lines that was particularly prominent in the spectra obtained at Mount Wilson Observatory was a line of CH but uh, this uh, seemed a rather daring assumption because I have here a laboratory spectrum of uh, CH, just an ordinary Bunsen burner, and it shows some hundred lines, shall I say. And uh, one of these lines agreed with this inter interstellar line, and that was somewhat daring until you realize that amongst these hundred lines, there's only a single one that uh, uh, comes from the lowest rotational level of the CH molecule and it is that line which is shown here in this enlargement uh, it is that line that has been observed in the interstellar medium. To identify interstellar lines the laboratory spectrum of the molecule needs to be accurately known. Spectra are recorded on a precisely aligned photographic plate. A point source of light is split into its component wavelengths by a diffraction grating and the resulting photographic plate analyzed using a traveling microscope. The source of the light is a discharge tube containing a suitable sample of gas. Since ions in the gas phase are generally formed only at high temperatures, it was surprising that one of the next molecules identified was an ion. The story goes back to a day on the 30th of June, as a matter of fact, in 1941, when the Yerkes Observatory, which is part of the University of Chicago, uh, had arranged a very informal meeting inviting spectroscopists as well as astronomers. And there were only perhaps uh, two dozen people or something of this order, uh, plus a few people who listened in from the observatory. Uh, and they uh, were confronted with observations, new observations of lines that do not belong to CH. And there were, in this spectrum that the Mount Wilson people had obtained, uh, there were some four or five lines that could not be assigned to CH, nor to CN, nor to any known molecule. And at this meeting, which I attended, we had a long discussion uh, what they could be and all sorts of possibilities were uh, envisaged. Uh, finally, it came down to a discussion between uh, Edward Teller and myself uh, in which we came to the conclusion that these lines are probably due to CH plus because of the 
similarity in the arrangement of the lines to a spectrum of BH. Boron hydride has the same number of electrons as CH+, and therefore the spectrum of CH+, was expected to be very similar to that of uh, BH. And the BH spectrum was well known. We happened to have a hollow cathode tube available, and we ran it with a carrier gas of helium and put a little bit of hydrocarbon in it. That was known to us as giving lots of CH. The question is, would it in the hollow cathode, cathode give us some CH plus? Well, we uh, uh, carried out a number of experiments changing the pressure and all this kind of thing, and uh, obtained some spectra that contained new, new bands. And these new bands uh, looked somewhat like this, uh, two of them. We had three or four, or, or more, even five. And here are two spectra, two bands, which show a very regular structure here and here. And when we looked now, without even analyzing this spectrum, after measuring it, of course, uh, we found that the line that belongs to the lowest rotational level of this particular molecule, whichever it is, that the, the line in both bands uh, agreed with two of these interstellar lines exactly within a few hundreds of an angstrom unit. And so there was no question that what we had in the laboratory was the same thing that is observed in the interstellar space. That didn't mean yet CH plus, because that we had to prove from the structure of the spectrum. We determined the moment of inertia from the spectrum, and we compared with other spectra, and various arguments led us to the conclusion that we felt was co uh, conclusive that this spectrum that we observed in the lab and that is identical in one line e of each band with the interstellar spectrum, that this spectrum is due to CH+. The discovery of CH+, was one of the first triumphs of molecular astronomy. In the 1940s, a new window was opened on interstellar space with the development of radio and microwave telescopes. Spectra in the radio and microwave region are generally due to molecules changing their rotational energy. One of the pioneers of microwave spectroscopy was Nobel Prize winner Charles Townes. Well, the simplest molecules have a beautifully simple spectrum. CO, for example, would, has its first rotational frequency at a few millimeters, and then its second rotational frequency is twice that high, or half the wavelength, and its third is one-third the wavelength, and so on, and goes on up on into the far infrared. The simplest molecules have that very simple harmonic type spectrum, very characteristic, very easily recognized. More complex molecules have lines that are not so simply spaced, but still they're calculable and, again, quite easily recognized, especially if we have laboratory spectra already of the molecules. And generally we do. We have laboratory spectra. We know just what those frequencies are. So when we look in interstellar space, we have an absolutely clear identification of the species we're looking at. In the radio region, it's easy to distinguish one frequency from a nearby frequency. You tune in the frequency very much like you'd tune a radio set. And so you can discriminate between one station and the next, even though they both may be fairly powerful. And the same thing is true for these broadcasting molecules. We can tune to one frequency or the other, and discrimination is uh, very easy. So through the work of Towns and others, Interstellar molecules could, for the first time, be identified through their rotational spectra, if these had been determined in the laboratory. Many more molecules have been identified this way than through optical spectroscopy, partly because faint signals are easier to detect in this region, but also because it isn't necessary to record the interstellar spectrum against a continuum background, as the molecules themselves emit the radiation. One of the most exciting developments was that astronomers were able, for the first time, to study the dense clouds which had hitherto been known only for their preventing starlight reaching us. Back in the 30s and 40s, there was a discovery of a few molecules through optical spectroscopy. I would say that was more or less an accidental discovery. They are molecules which are very hardy, with the spectral ultraviolet light, so perhaps it was not so surprising. But it was clear there are some molecules, and uh, from then on, uh, one might look for other molecules which are equally hardy, but also probably very scarce. Uh, on the other hand, more complex molecules, more delicate molecules, were really not expected for a long time. But we did know that there were large clouds of dark material 
in our galaxy. Uh, those had been seen and noticed. They weren't studied very much because astronomers were dealing with optical light and they could get nothing from a dark cloud very much. So they were not at all understood and it was assumed that their densities were somewhat similar to the densities of the clouds through which we could see stars and it's not very dense and probably no molecules were there. Radio telescopes have proved invaluable in determining the composition of dense clouds. But the first major discovery of radio astronomy in interstellar space was a signal due not to a molecule, but to an atom, the hydrogen atom. Radio astronomy had gotten going shortly after World War II, particularly in Great Britain and in Australia, uh, where people were looking at the continuum radiation from ionized material in interstellar space. Uh, and that was a very powerful and important field for some time, and then the fine structure line, a hyperfine structure line, rather, of hydrogen was discovered at 21 centimeters wavelength, and that gave rise to a lot of important astronomy. A hydrogen atom has a single electron and a nucleus with a spin and a magnetic moment. The electron has a magnetic moment, the nucleus has a magnetic moment. They interact uh, and give an energy associated with the change in orientation of the nucleus and the electron. And it's that change in orientation which produces the energy and gives this frequency of a wavelength of about 21 centimeters. That was first discovered by Purcell and Ewan at, at Harvard, uh, and it allowed people then to study the existence and distribution of hydrogen atoms in great detail with radio astronomy. Now, the interesting thing is that while the hydrogen atoms were detectable, hydrogen molecules were not. And so even in these dark clouds, nobody could tell whether there was hydrogen there or not. They knew there weren't very many hydrogen atoms. Uh, but the fact that the hydrogen molecules were very rich and abundant uh, just could not be detected at that time because the hydrogen molecule has no radio spectrum. In fact, the very first interstellar molecule identified by radio astronomy was detected here at Millstone Hill Observatory in 1963 by Alan Barrett. Mid-1950s and early 1960s, the only uh, species known in the interstellar medium, that is the molecular species, uh, were CH and CN, diatomic molecules. Uh, the cosmic abundance of oxygen is comparable with the cosmic abundance of carbon. Therefore, it was logical to expect that OH existed in the interstellar medium. It had not been detected because the uh, visible uh, optical lines, if you will, transitions of OH, are in the ultraviolet. And those are heavily absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. Therefore, interstellar OH was invisible other than at radio wavelengths. Well, once the frequency was measured accurately in the laboratory in 1959, any radio astronomer that uh, managed to assemble a receiver that would work at 1667 megacycles uh, and, and had available a relatively large antenna would have uh, been able to do the experiment we did. But I guess it was the feeling among the radio astronomers that the signal would be so weak that uh, one wouldn't learn too much from studying OH. I didn't share that opinion. Four years later, Professor Barrett and his colleagues had a chance to search for OH. They chose to point the telescope towards a strong radio source, one of the brightest in the sky, in the constellation of Cassiopeia, and looked for OH in absorption against this strong background. We set up here at Millstone Observatory with all our equipment and uh, tied the receiver into a computer to analyze and display the output of the receiver. And uh, we took a while getting the bugs out of the equipment and making it work properly. But the day finally came when we started tracking on Cassiopeia with all the apparatus, the computer, uh, working properly. And in very short time, we saw see, the absorption on Cassiopeia, which we were expecting to see. It was a very 
exciting moment when we realized that we had it. In this way, it was shown the OH was indeed interstellar. Using the radio telescope, the intensity of the received signal was measured over a range of frequencies. This line was the spectrum observed with the telescope pointed directly at Cassiopeia, and this second line, that with the telescope pointing just off the source for comparison. The feature here is due to absorption of interstellar OH between us and Cassiopeia. One might ask, how do we know that this OH we are seeing is interstellar and not atmospheric? There are several answers to that question, but one which is absolutely rock stable is that we observed two weeks later. Now the Earth has moved in its orbit around the sun in two weeks time. So the OH line will be slightly Doppler shifted from what it was two weeks previously. That is, if it's interstellar OH, it will be shifted. The absorption is quite strong. So why did it take so long after the OH spectrum was measured for interstellar OH to be seen? When OH was measured in the laboratory in the mid-1950s, it was measured uh, at readily accessible transitions, not the lowest one. And it is only the lowest you, that you expect to find in the interstellar medium. Therefore, the result of the laboratory measurements was not an exact measurement of the interstellar OH frequency, but an establishment of the constants of the molecule so you could calculate the lowest frequency. But nothing's perfect. The calculation had an uncertainty of uh, maybe 10 megacycles. And uh, when one is starting to look for a weak molecule, a weak signal, uh, you want to look at the exact frequency and not have to search or scan over the entire range. When OH was finally observed, the spectrum also gave information on the structure of the interstellar medium. Well, one thing that we could tell immediately, uh, even with the initial absorption measurements in Cassiopeia, is that uh, the OH absorption line uh, was not the single line that we thought it would be when we looked with very, very high frequency resolution. It was a double line. Whereas if you look at the 21 centimeter hydrogen line with the same resolution, it's a single line. Why is that? There are really two clouds out there in the line of sight between here and, and Cassiopeia. They are moving slightly differently. Therefore, their velocities are slightly different. Therefore, their absorption lines are shifted a tiny amount. Now, OH is 17 times heavier than a hydrogen atom. Therefore, it moves more slowly at the same temperature. Therefore, the width of the absorption line will be narrower in OH than it is in the hydrogen. The velocities of the two clouds are so near together that in hydrogen, they overlap, and all we see is one line, even though there are really two clouds there. But with the OH moving more slowly, we resolve the individual clouds. After Barrett's discovery of OH, Many other molecules were found. In 1968, the first off-the-shelf molecule, ammonia, by Professor Towns. But as well as identifying molecules, the observations also tell us about temperatures and densities and the extent of ionization in the interstellar medium. We can calculate from theory very well how rapidly the molecules lose their energy. If a molecule is rotating like this, a little dipole is radiating, we know exactly how fast it'll radiate and how fast it's losing, it, losing its energy. So to stay in this excited state of rotating rapidly, it must be excited by collisions. A hydrogen atom or a helium, a hydrogen molecule or helium atom strikes it and by collision makes it rotate again and so it radiates some more. And now we know the rate at which it dies down and loses its energy. In order to stay energetic, we know the rates of collisions and that tells us then the density. It also tells us a good deal of information about the energy of the collisions. 
because if we see molecules excited very highly, we know they must have been hit very energetically. And that tells us the temperature of the gas surrounding them, which is making a collision. So we learn both the density and the temperature almost immediately. The studies of interstellar material, which uh, were allowed by the uh, spectrum of the hydrogen atom, this 21 centimeter line, and by other studies with optical spectra, indicated that the interstellar medium had a density of about one molecule per cubic centimeter only. Some clouds are a little more dense, perhaps 10 molecules per cubic centimeter, uh, but not more so. Uh, once ammonia was discovered, it was clear the densities in these dark clouds was very much higher. 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 molecules per cubic centimeter. It gave a very clear indication of these exceedingly high densities by comparison with what astronomers had been accustomed to dealing with and hence what they expected. If you ionize a molecule like CH or CN or N2, uh, you, uh, the electron goes away and never comes back because the free, main free path is so large, is, uh, is as big as our solar system. And so, uh, well, there may be other electrons around that will collide, but the, the frequency of collision uh, under these conditions is of the order of several hundred years. And therefore, uh, once you have formed an ion, it will remain there unless it is destroyed by something else. But it can only be destroyed either by light or by cosmic radiation. That is, protons or other particles, uh, high-speed particles. And when you talk about uh, violent conditions, that, of course, is violent. If you have uh, cosmic rays of an energy of many million electron volts going through this interstellar cloud, it will, if you like, play havoc with the molecules. But again, the intensities are so small and the density is so low that only a few will be uh, affected by this violence. But even then, uh, that is one way of producing the ions. The diffuse interstellar clouds are penetrated by ultraviolet radiation as well as by cosmic rays. Larger molecules are thus found only in the dark, dense clouds where the formation rates are greater and ultraviolet radiation doesn't reach. New and more complex molecules are still being discovered in the interstellar medium. And scientists such as Charles Towns at Berkeley are even learning more about the origins of the stars because of molecules in space. The most immediate thing was the fact that fairly delicate molecules do in fact exist and hence there must be many more of them and there were many more of them and immediately lots of, them, lots of additional ones were found. We, we obtained the density and found the clouds were really quite dense. The total mass of the clouds were large, so large that one would have expected them to collapse pretty rapidly and form new stars. These are stellar nurseries and in the interior of these clouds the material is being pulled together gravitationally and new stars are being formed. We never have a chance to see those stars in an early stage outside of clouds. So we must study them inside of the clouds while they're being formed and shortly after their birth before they work their way out of the clouds. 